Hi, everyone. Welcome to Escapees webinars. Tonight, we're chatting with David Goldstein, who is one of our staff members, but also very well informed on healthcare options for pre-Medicare RVers. And so he has decided he's offered to join us tonight to talk a little bit more about that. Um, so I just want to thank you all for coming in and, uh, and sharing your evening with us to, so you can learn a little a lot more about this. I know this is a really tough topic that is changing all the time. And so we're really grateful to have David here. Um, just a couple of quick little housekeeping things. If you have any questions as David goes along, feel free to go ahead and add them to the, the comments here on Facebook and we'll get to them. Um, David's agreed to do a Q&A at the end of his presentation. And so we'll get to those questions. Um, and also, if you have any kind of, if you ever need, if you need clarification, there's some some of the the words that we use when we're talking about insurance might not be familiar to you, especially if you're newer to RVing. And so, feel free to even ask questions like that, and we can take a step back real quick and clarify something if we need to along the way to make sure that you're able to keep up with us. And so, um, yeah, we're really excited to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us for this webinar. Um, David, you want to take a moment to introduce yourself, and then let's let's hear about healthcare options for RVers. All right. Thanks, George Ann. Thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight. So uh, I am uh, an RVer, just like you. I, I, am, I don't work in the insurance industry. My wife and I have been on the road four and a half years uh, now, full time. I'm now 59. I was 55 when we started RVing. And uh, as my wife frequently reminds me, she will always be younger than me. Uh, I'm a recovering lawyer, uh, spent most of my career when I was working full time as an entrepreneur and I retired uh, when we went on the road and uh, now work part time for escapees. But I want to mention that what I'm talking about here are really my own opinions. Uh, I, my wife and I lead the Hangouts program, which absolutely has nothing to do with health insurance. So uh, what I'm telling you here is, is just as a fellow member. Um, I got all this information because I had to navigate all these options myself. Uh, back at the end of 2017, when my Cobra from my job was running out, I had to figure all this out. And it was just amazing that there were not good resources out there. So I took all the stuff that I learned and tried to distill it down into uh, this presentation. So what we're going to cover tonight is the following. Uh, first of all, we're going to talk about some important healthcare concepts just to get some definitions uh, under our belts. We're going to talk about the available options for healthcare coverage. And notice I'm not calling that insurance because some of the options are insurance and many of them are not. We're going to talk about subsidies under the Affordable Care Act. Uh, we'll talk about how to choose from the different options that are available. And at the end, I've included a couple of pages of resources, links to various things on the web uh, that you might want to explore for further information. There's a ton of information in here. And uh, so I've put a PDF copy of this presentation uh, on our Dropbox at the link that you see on the screen. And uh, the uh, Georgianne and Jeannie will post that also in the chat from time to time so that you have that. Um, so you don't have to worry about trying to write down every single thing I say. All right, so uh, here we go. Uh, this is, according to Dante, what was written over the gates of hell, abandon hope all ye who enter here. Uh, and it seems appropriate for a discussion about health care options because this can just be mind numbing stuff. Uh, and there's a lot of it. So uh, bear with me. We'll answer questions at the end. As George Ann said, type your comments in whenever you or type your questions in whenever you uh, have a thought, a comment, something that you want clarified at the end. And we'll get to most of those at the very end of the uh, of the broadcast. All right. So as promised, uh, let's start out with some important concepts for our viewers when we're talking about healthcare. And I want to start with what is the purpose of healthcare coverage? Um, the purpose of healthcare coverage is not to cover your routine medical expenses. I hear some people say, particularly you know, people who are in their twenties, thirties, forties. I'm young, I'm healthy, I don't take any prescription medications, I don't have any chronic illnesses, I don't need to worry about healthcare coverage. And really nothing could be further from the truth. Um, they are thinking of healthcare coverage as something to defray routine medical expenses, and that's not really what it's about. The purpose is also not to avoid a tax penalty. You know, there used to be a tax penalty 
under the Affordable Care Act if you didn't carry insurance. That went away in 2019, so we don't have to worry about that. So what is it? The purpose of having health care coverage is to cover potentially catastrophic, unexpected loss. And the key word there is unexpected. It's things you can't foresee due to either a severe illness or traumatic injury. So what are we talking about here? Things like cancer, stroke, heart attack. There's a pandemic going on uh, that affects some people pretty severely. And, uh, you know, that can hit anybody. Those things can hit anyone regardless of your health or your age. Um, covering routine benefits, or sorry, routine expenses is a nice side benefit, but it shouldn't be the primary consideration for choosing a, a health care plan unless you have a chronic illness that you know of that requires a lot of care or brand name prescriptions or something like that. So why do we care? Well, if we don't have coverage, we have two big risks. Uh, one is that some providers, and when we're talking about providers, we mean hospitals, doctors, emergency rooms, things like that. Providers may refuse to offer services if you can't prove an ability to pay the bill. Uh, and in general, that means having some kind of insurance. Now, policies vary widely, but you really don't want to take that chance. The other reason is to keep yourself out of financial disaster. You know, as the quote says here, nearly 60 percent of people who filed for, for bankruptcy cited medical expenses as one of the reasons more than home foreclosures or student loans. Uh, because these are unexpected and they get out of hand very, very quickly. And so the question I ask people who say, you know, I don't need health insurance, I'm young, and I'm healthy, is do you really want to play Russian roulette with your future? Because sooner or later, one of these things will probably catch up with you. Second uh, concept to understand is nationwide access. And this is particularly important to us as RVers because we travel. Uh, most people are in their, you know, who, who live in a sticks and bricks, they're in their home state pretty much all the time. They may have an emergency when they're on vacation, but generally for they get a sore throat or something like that, they can go to a provider in their state. We don't have that luxury. Uh, we're traveling all the time. And so one of the things we are really interested in is do I have access to the, the uh, provider network outside my home state? Now, uh, this is sometimes difficult to determine from the information that the insurers or other organizations provide. And so ask them if you're not sure. If I need to see a doctor for a routine thing and I'm not in X state, am I still covered? And is there still a network? What you want to look for in the literature is something like this plan provides access to a nationwide provider network. If you see words like that, it's pretty much sure that you're going to have nationwide coverage. You also want to look at the type of plan, whether it's an HMO, a health maintenance organization, or a PPO or EPO, which is a preferred provider organization or exclusive provider organization. And for our purposes, we're going to consider those last two the same thing, even though they're slightly different. The problem with an HMO is that they use a primary care physician that you have to designate as a gatekeeper before you can see any kind of specialist. And that person's going to be in your home state. So that makes it kind of impractical for people who travel because you can't always get back to your home state to see your PCP first before you go to see a gastroenterologist or whatever specialty you need. In addition, a lot of HMOs and even some PPOs and EPOs provide no coverage outside their home state except for emergencies. True insurance will always cover you for an emergency out of state, but the definition of what's an emergency can be really narrow. Basically, if it's something that's life-threatening, um, then uh, uh, you know your it, true insurance will cover you no matter where you are. But they may require you, depending on the policy, to travel back to your home state for follow-up care. And as RVers, we really don't want to have to do that. If you happen to be in Washington State and you're domiciled in Florida, that's a long trip to make when you're you're sick or you're not feeling well. So nationwide access is important. Third concept uh, that's important for our viewers is domicile. We're all, if you're a full-timer or even a, a part-timer, you're probably already familiar with the concept of domicile. What's relevant here is that you have to get health insurance coverage or health care uh, coverage in the zip code of your domicile. Uh, where you live and um, in terms of both state and county may drive your choice of domicile. And and so and even where you quote live within the state. 
So you need to, if you're thinking about a domicile change to another state, you need to really understand what health uh, coverage options are available to you where you are and compare those to where you're thinking about changing. You might find, for example, that you're thinking about changing to Texas. Texas really does not have very good uh, non-group coverage options uh, for our viewers because there's not access to nationwide networks on the individual plans that are offered. You might find that even though Texas is attractive because it doesn't have an income tax and it has low sales tax and some other things, that your current state of domicile might actually offer better options for you for your particular circumstances even though it might not otherwise be as favorable maybe there's a small income tax you have to pay to the state but that might be more than offset by by savings and premiums so make sure you 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 check that out and you you actually get quotes for whatever zip code you're going to be domiciling in the next concept to talk about, and we've, we've mentioned it already a couple times, is the Affordable Care Act. And you may know this as Obamacare. I will refer to it sometimes tonight as the ACA, just because it, it slides off the tongue a little easier. The thing, it, it permeates everything to do with actual medical insurance nowadays. And we're gonna talk a lot about that, but what I want you to understand about the ACA is that it is much more than just subsidies for low and middle income people. It provides numerous consumer protections for plans that comply with the requirements of the law. Now, the downside of the ACA is that for traditional insurance, it's caused higher premiums for a couple of reasons. First of all, because it requires fairly broad coverage. We'll talk about that. And the other is because of the political uncertainty that has swirled around the ACA for the last several years. And you know, the issue there is insurers have to set their rates at the beginning of the year they don't know what's going to happen, what Congress is going to do in any given year. So they bump their rates up somewhat to uh, accommodate that risk. I will tell you that uh, at least our experience is that the ACA plan premiums have stabilized a little bit in the last few years. In fact, the plan that we've been on for the last two years actually decreased about $7 a month uh, uh, for 2021. It's not a lot, but it's a decrease. You know, I'll take it. Now I've mentioned ACA compliant plans and non-compliant plans. So what's the difference? Well, there's several different uh, Im important areas where the two kinds of plans uh, differ and we're gonna talk about both groups. So one is that ACA compliant plans are regulated uh, by federal law. They are kind of by definition insurance. Um, Non-ACA compliant plans may or may not be regulated and the extent to which they're regulated depends on the type of plan and the state and how strict they are on those kinds of plans. So you're getting the benefit of more regulation um, with an ACA compliant plan. An ACA compliant plan has to cover 10 essential health benefits. We're gonna look at those on the next slide, um, but non-compliant plans often omit one or more of those benefits like mental health, substance abuse, wellness checks, things like that couple of the biggest things on the ACA compliant plans, you are guaranteed to, be, guaranteed to be accepted. You cannot be denied for an ACA compliant plan. Whereas on a non-compliant plan, you can, you're gonna go through a process called underwriting where they're gonna ask questions about your health and they may decide to either not cover you or charge you more. ACA compliant plans are always renewable. You are guaranteed that when at the end of the plan term, you can renew that plan for another year, even if your health has changed. Whereas on a non-compliant plan, the insurer may be able to refuse to renew you due to changes in your health during that term. The biggest thing, the one that you hear that's the political hot potato right now is coverage for pre-existing conditions. Under an ACA compliant plan, pre-existing conditions must be covered. Under a non-compliant plan, they usually are not. Um, and this is one of the reasons why the ACA made premiums go up is the requirement to cover pre-existing conditions. Non-compliant plans will usually exclude pre-existing conditions for anywhere from one to five years or possibly cover them never. Another difference, ACA compliant plans have unlimited lifetime benefits. Uh, Non-ACA compliant plans usually have a lifetime cap on the most that they'll pay and maybe an annual uh, cap as well. Why does this matter? Well, you have a serious injury or a serious or chronic illness 
that requires millions of dollars in treatment. Um, hopefully nobody listening to this ever has to go through that, but this is why you buy insurance, right? On most of these non-compliant plans, your lifetime benefit's gonna be limited to one to $3 million. And after that, you're out of luck. So uh, that's something really to look at. It's not necessarily a huge consideration for somebody who's in good health, uh, but something to think about. Now, a couple of downsides. Uh, ACA compliant plans do not allow you to enroll any time. We're gonna talk about that in a second, but there's only a short period of time each year when you can enroll. Non-ACA compliant plans, generally you can enroll any time during the year. The tax penalty is no longer an issue for either type of plan. ACA compliant plans are eligible for federal subsidies, which can offset a huge amount of your premium. We're gonna go into that in some detail, a non-ACA compliant plans are not. And so one of the most important things is to figure out, are you eligible for a federal subsidy? And we'll talk about that. And if you are, really uh, see if there's a way you can get onto an ACA compliant plan. The other big downside about the ACA compliant plans, they are, as we mentioned, very expensive, especially if you can't get subsidies, non-compliant plans usually cost less. I mentioned the essential health benefits that an ACA compliant plan is required to provide. There are 10 of them, and you see them here on this slide. Non-compliant plans will often omit things like mental health and substance abuse. Sometimes they will omit prescription drug coverage. Sometimes they will omit uh, rehab services. Uh, sometimes they will omit maternity coverage. Um, and so you really need to look carefully when you're thinking about a non-compliant plan to understand what's not covered. I also mentioned with the ACA compliant plans that you can only sign up during a specific time. It's called the enrollment window. And um, why do they do this? Well, because otherwise you could wait till you get sick and then sign up for insurance. And that means only the sick people would have insurance and rates would skyrocket higher than they have been. So for ACA compliant plans, there is there are two types of enrollment periods. There's open enrollment, which if you've ever worked at a company that provides health insurance, you've heard about. It's usually November 1st through December 15th. So we've got another, uh, what, six days left in this year's open enrollment for 2021 coverage for um, plans through the federal marketplace. Some employers use a slightly different uh, window. Some states have made the period a little longer and some plans, employer-sponsored plans, especially ones by large employer groups may have different periods. Uh, the other type of enrollment is a special enrollment period, and this is important for us as our viewers. You get a special period to enroll 60 days from the time that you have a qualifying life event. And that includes things that don't happen that often like marriage or having or adopting a child. But uh, it also includes things that we tend to do sometimes more frequently or more easily, things like moving. If you change your domicile, you have moved to a different state and you are entitled to a special enrollment period anytime uh, that you move. You don't have to wait until open enrollment. Uh, two other things that can trigger a special enrollment period, involuntary loss of other coverage, Note the word there, involuntary. So this would be things like job loss, uh, divorce, uh, where your spouse is providing the coverage, uh, COBRA expiration, aging off a parent's plan if you become 26. Does not include voluntary cover, uh, terminations. You can't just decide to terminate the plan you're on and get a special enrollment period. The other one that's pretty interesting is a change in income. And this is true if you're working with insurance on the federal or state marketplaces. You have to estimate your income at the beginning of the year. If it turns out that your income is going to change substantially, you get a raise, you get a bonus, you lose your job, anything like that, um, you're entitled to a special enrollment period, which allows you to go in and either subscribe to a new plan or change to a different plan if that's what you want to do. Uh, so keep those in mind. There is a lot of flexibility outside of just open enrollment. All right. So with those concepts out of the way, Let's look at some of the options that are available to us as RVers. And these are the ones we're gonna talk about. I've grouped them into ACA compliant options and non-compliant options. So the ACA compliant options are uh, group or employer provided coverage, COBRA continuation coverage of group coverage, and individual major medical plans. And that includes uh, coverage that you buy on a health insurance exchange, either healthcare.gov or a state exchange. Those are all individual major medical plans. 
Non-compliant plans are things like short-term medical, fixed benefit, also called indemnity plans, and healthcare sharing ministries or health cost sharing ministries. And we'll talk about each of those in a little bit of detail. So let's look first at, maybe, at the group uh, coverage. This is what you have if you have a job and your employer provides you with health insurance. It's almost always going to be ACA compliant. It's subsidized, but not by the federal government. It's subsidized by your employer. At least your employee coverage is. Dependent coverage usually is not, except for some very generous companies. Whether there's nationwide coverage varies depending on the policy that the employer has picked. Basically, if you have group coverage, you're generally going to want to keep it. There's very few reasons to ditch group coverage if it's available to you. It will usually be better and less expensive than anything else you can get. Here's a catch. If it's available to you, but you decline it, you are not eligible for subsidies under the Affordable Care Act. And this applies not only to you as the employee, it also applies to all your dependents who would be eligible for coverage with your employer had you elected that coverage. So it's real risky to decline your group coverage uh, if you're currently employed. There is an exception called the affordable coverage rule, which we'll look at. It does not come into play very often, particularly if you have dependents who you're covering on your insurance, but every once in a while that'll come into play. So the second type of uh, ACA compliant plan is going to be COBRA continuation coverage. And you have to be employed or have been employed to have this. Um, this is what happens when you uh, leave your job. COBRA, uh, which is a federal act, requires most employers, if they have 20 or more employees, to offer continuation of health insurance coverage to all terminating employees, regardless of the reason that they were terminated. Fired, laid off, furloughed, um, uh, you retired, uh, quit voluntarily, any of those, you are entitled to COBRA if your employer is above 20 employees. Uh, COBRA coverage lasts up to 18 months. It has a bad rap because it's like, oh, it's so expensive. And it probably is for the employee compared to what you were seeing in payroll deductions because your employer is no longer subsidizing it. But it's still with um, dependents, basically not any more expensive unless your employer was subsidizing that coverage too. They do have the right to add a 2% administrative fee, but that's really not going to make a, a huge difference. So don't ignore COBRA coverage automatically. You may already be bearing most of the premium cost as an employee, and it may not be that much more expensive. You have th uh, 30 days during uh, after your termination during which to elect COBRA. Um, and in that period of time, you can look at other plans. You can change to a different plan from your employer. You can change to... Uh, a non-employer plan. Um, so look at all your options. One thing to understand is unlike group coverage, if you have COBRA available, but you opt not to take it, that does not disqualify you for an ACA subsidy. However, if you elect to take COBRA, you are no longer eligible for ACA subsidies until either your 18 months has run out or the next open enrollment period. So be very careful when you're making an election, understand uh, what your options are and, uh, and both from your employer and otherwise. The third category is, of ACA compliant plans is individual major medical plans. And these are the ones that uh, most of us, because our employers don't necessarily offer healthcare coverage, we may be working part-time, we may be retired early. Uh, this is what most of us are gonna be looking at. If it says major medical, uh, that generally means that it is an ACA compliant plan because it offers at least the minimum essential coverage. OK, we'll talk about the subsidies here in a separate separate section. The problem with most of these plans or one of the problems with most of these plans is that very few of them offer a nationwide provider network. And so you have to really uh, check into that to find out whether they do or not. The other problem is that the availability of these plans varies greatly by state. And I'm not, you know, well versed on every single state. So you need to look at your current state of domicile. I can tell you that of the three states that are most popular with RVers for domicile, those being uh, South Dakota, Texas and Florida, only Florida offers PPOs on the marketplace, individual major medical plans 
uh, that have nationwide coverage. Uh, Texas does not, that's not to say you might not be able to find an individual non-subsidized plan through a broker that offers nationwide coverage, but it's likely to be very, very expensive. So those are the compliant plans. Now let's look at the non-compliant plans. Now remember, these aren't regulated as much. They don't have to provide all the same benefits, but in exchange, they have a lot more flexibility, but it really is kind of buyer beware. You have to understand what you're buying. So the first type and the one that you've probably heard a lot about over the last couple of years is short-term medical plans. These are also now uh, in marketing speak, insurance marketing speak, called tri-term medical plans because that sounds better than short term. And because the length of time that you can have these was expanded by the Trump administration up to 36 years, sorry, 36 months from 12 months. So, uh, so three terms of 12 months gives you tri-term. All of these plans provide limited benefits. So they usually, almost always, will exclude pre-existing conditions. They're gonna have a relatively low lifetime cap. They're not gonna provide all essential health benefits. But what they're intended to be used or what they were originally intended to be used as is a bridge between employer coverage and some other coverage, either another employer or Medicare. They were never really intended to be permanent health insurance. Um, and so that's why they provide just kind of you know, minimal coverage. Uh, they always have a limited term uh, up to 12 months, but some states restrict the, the term to three or six months. They're renewable up to 36 months, as I mentioned. One of the things that you'll see with these, and it's true for most of these non-compliant plans, is that they're subject to underwriting. Underwriting means they're going to ask you a lot of health questions before they accept you into their insurance program. They're going to ask you, have you ever been diagnosed with diabetes? Have you ever been diagnosed with asthma? Have you ever had cancer in your life? Things like that. And your answers will determine whether or not they will accept you into the plan and how much they're going to charge you. Unlike in the ACA compliant plans where everybody has to be charged the same rate other than based on age and smoking history and gender. Uh, a short-term plan can charge you, uh, upcharge you if they want uh, based on your pre-existing conditions or your past health history. Another thing you have to watch out for with these plans is what's called back-end underwriting. And what that means in the industry is they'll ask you some simple, easy to answer questions up front when you apply. Um, things like do you smoke and, and things like that. But when you submit a claim, they'll start digging into your health history to find out if there's any chance that maybe the injury or illness that you're claiming for is due to a pre-existing condition. And if so, they will exclude it from coverage. That's a pretty ugly surprise to get uh, once you've already suffered the illness or injury. So you really have to be aware of that and be, be sure, just go into it understanding that if you have something that arises from anything that could be considered a pre-existing condition, the insurer may re uh, refuse to cover it. Uh, Short-term plans are available currently in 40 states. There are 10 states that have said we're not going to do these because they're really not very consumer friendly, but it's an option to, to uh, think about. Um, also understand that when you renew these, there's no guarantee on most of these plans that the, the insurer will renew you and there's no guarantee that your premiums won't go up. So there's a lot of risk involved with these. A second option for non-compliant plans, and one that's kind of interesting, is fixed benefit plans. These are also called indemnity plans. And you may think you don't know what these are, but you have uh, seen at least one, I guarantee you, on TV, because that's what AFLAC is, and everybody has seen the AFLAC duck. AFLAC is a fixed indemnity plan where they pay you cash when you are sick or hospitalized and have to miss work. Uh, and I'm not even sure missing work is, is a requirement. So basically the way fixed benefit indemnity plans work is there is a schedule of illnesses and injuries and a fixed dollar amount that they will pay you for each one. So for example, they some a plan might say, we will pay you $100 per physician visit, we'll pay you $3,000 per day of hospitalization, we will pay $5,000 towards surgery and so on and so on. There's a long schedule, we'll look at one of those. Basically, most of these plans allow you to adjust how much you get paid by the insurer for each event. Obviously, the higher benefit you opt for, the higher your premium is going to be. National coverage with these is usually not an issue because the insurer does not care about where you get the service because they're going to pay the same amount regardless.
regardless. And so most of these plans allow you to see any licensed doctor or hospital in the country. Um, an important difference and something to look at if you go to look at these plans, some of the fixed benefit or indemnity plans also give you access to a managed care network like PHCS. There are a number of other ones. Managed care networks contract with providers to offer their services at a discount. And if you can get a, a provider in a network at a discounted rate, that's going to put you uh, pretty far ahead. We're going to look at why uh, in just a second. Most of these plans require some simple underwriting, but generally are not subject to back-end underwriting. Of course, your mileage may vary depending on the, the provider. I mentioned the benefit schedule. This is what one of them looks like. Um, this is a benefit schedule from a couple years ago from a United Healthcare uh, fixed indemnity plan that was being marketed to RVers. And honestly, it was, you know, if you, if you absolutely cannot afford true insurance, um, this is probably one of the next best things. It's a real insurance company. The, you know, there's no question that they will pay the benefits that they've provided. And you can adjust how much risk you want to take on by how much premium you're willing to pay. There's usually a multiple tiers of benefits for each of the different services that are covered. So I've kind of alluded to the, the risk of fixed benefit plans a little bit, and I, this is a little bit hard to understand, so I did this graphic to, to help convey it. Fixed benefit plans are not insurance, okay? Even if it's called indemnity, it's still not insurance. Um, true insurance, remember, is there to cover the catastrophic costs. So with true insurance, you pay the first dollar, actually more than the first dollar, some amount, uh, which is fixed, it's defined in your insurance contract, and that's your co-pays, your deductibles, things like that. And then the insurance is going to pay everything above that amount, regardless of how much it is. Fixed benefit plans work just the opposite. The plan pays a fixed amount first for each covered event, so they have the first dollar liability, and then you are responsible for everything above that amount no matter how much it is. And so it's exactly the opposite of insurance. Um, so the risk with a fixed benefit plan is that, you, you know, if you have something really serious happen and you didn't buy enough coverage, you could be responsible for a large amount. However, you can mitigate that, first of all, by making sure that you buy a meaningful amount of benefit. So don't go just for the cheapest option. Make sure you, you purchase you know, find out what a hot typical hospital stay costs, find out what a typical surgery costs, and purchase enough coverage to cover the average thing. The other thing is that um, with a fixed benefit plan in your pocket, you're in a better position to negotiate with the provider than you are if you have no insurance at all. Um, you can go and say, look, um, I, you know, I know you charge me $5,000 a day for the hospital room. My plan only pays 4000 I can't really afford to pay the difference. Will you take 4000 And it may be a little bit of a give and take, but a lot of times, you know, hospitals, other providers will write off some of that expense if they understand that you can't pay it. Now we come to health cost sharing ministries, and this is a, a, a sticky subject. So what is a health cost sharing ministry? Basically, uh, there's like a million people who have subscribed to these, and they were originally created for certain religious communities that objected to traditional insurance, but they've been expanded now to be open to the general public. And how they work is members of the ministry contribute a share, which is more or less like a premium payment monthly. And all that money gets put into a pool. And then the ministry pays member claims out of that pool. Most of these, because they are religious based in some way, require uh, you to say that you will follow a common set of religious or sometimes ethical beliefs. It may be something as simple as belief in a higher power, or it may be something very specific, being willing to live your life according to Catholic principles or something like that. Um, and so you have to you know, look at that and see if that jibes with you know, your own beliefs. There are a couple of advantages to these plans. One is that the share amount, which again is like a premium, is usually less than what you would pay on an unsubsidized individual major medical plan. And the other thing is most of these ministries do provide you with access to 
a provider network so that you get the benefit of the agreed discounts up front, which limit your exposure and obviously the plan's exposure as well. But as you may have inferred from what I'm saying, these plans uh, come with a number of risks. And, that, and for that reason, they've really been carefully scrutinized by many states. Uh, right now, they are not subject to federal regulation and there is little or no state regulation. They're actually exempted from the Affordable Care Act because they're religious based. Um, and uh, although some states are starting to regulate them, you don't get the consumer protections that are available uh, from a heavily regulated insurance industry. One of the things that scares me is there's no guarantee of payment. Uh, it depends how much money is in the pool when you make your claim. If you have a big claim and the pool has shrunk a lot because there's a lot of other big claims that month, you may only get a partial reimbursement or you may get none at all, or you may get told you have to wait six months and so there's more money in the pool. Uh, we know people this has actually happened to. There's a lot of people who have had great experiences with health, co health cost sharing ministries, but there are some who have had downright scary experiences. Um, and, and again, because it's not regulated, there's nobody standing behind the ministry to make sure they actually can pay. They usually provide little or no coverage for pre-existing conditions. Generally, it's covered only if the condition was cured at least one to five years ago, depending on the condition. If you have a chronic condition like diabetes or asthma or something like that, that never really goes away, you're never gonna have coverage for that or other conditions arising from it. And so you have to really think about that. HCSMs can charge higher rates or decline membership completely based on your health status. So they do a form of underwriting up front. They offer limited services because uh, it's just not economical for them to offer all the um, essential health benefits. So they usually exclude things like mental health care, preventive care, uh, and they usually limit or exclude prescription drugs. They almost always have a cap to protect themselves on the amount that will be paid annually and during your lifetime. They may have exclusions related to beliefs of the group. Um, for example, if you know, you've said, I'll abstain from alcohol and you go have a couple of drinks and you're in a car accident, they might say, no, you said you would abstain from alcohol. We're not going to cover your injuries as a result of the car accident because alcohol was involved. And then finally, not all providers will accept coverage um, because this isn't really insurance. There's no guarantee of payment. The provider very often will require you to pay up front and then get reimbursed by the ministry so that you are taking the risk rather than them. So, you know, they really are, as this quote says, a leap of faith, both literally and figuratively. Um, they might have their place uh, because they're better than nothing, um, but you really have. To. Okay, so uh, we, we just finished talking about health cost sharing ministries. Now we're talking about ACA subsidies. When we talk about a subsidy, we're talking about a premium tax credit. And what this is, is an amount that is based on your income, uh, and it's a dollar for dollar reduction in your income tax. But you can actually get it ahead of time, called the advanced premium tax credit, and you use it month to month to offset your health insurance premium bills. So it has the effect of reducing your premiums that you pay for your insurance. Um, you have to estimate your income at the beginning of the year. And your income has to be between 100% and 400% of the federal poverty level. Don't let that word poverty uh, scare you. It is just a number that the, they use as a reference point to determine who's middle income enough to be able to um, uh, you know, take advantage of this figure. Okay, and I'll show you what the figures are here in a second. You do have to reconcile it on your tax return. So you have to file a tax return and you have to say, here's what my actual income was. Here's the advanced PTC that I got. And if you got more subsidy than you were entitled to, you'll have to pay it back. If you didn't take enough subsidy because your income was lower than projected, then you actually get an additional credit on your tax return. So it works both ways. And there's a limitation. If you underestimated, there's a limitation on how much you have to pay back as long as you don't go over that 400% maximum, which is called the Obamacare cliff. And we'll have a slide on that. So what do subsidies do for us? This is a hypothetical family of two adults, no children, both age 55, non-smokers in Sumter County, Florida, where escapees uh, has the, the park that a lot of us use as our domicile. It's an unsubsidized silver plan, or it's a silver plan 
that had a premium of $1,606 a month. And there's two parts to this graph. The, the blue line with the circles shows the premium, the amount of premium tax credit that you're receiving as a function of income, which is on the horizontal axis of the graph. And you can see that as your income goes up, the amount of premium tax credit you get goes down. But it doesn't go to zero. It only drops about 30%. The part of the graph on the bottom, the bar chart, shows your estimated net premium. So that's the $1,600 a month minus the premium tax credit you're getting. And you can see that um, you know, even at the highest income levels that would qualify for a subsidy, that makes the $1,600 plan pretty affordable at $541 a month. So the subsidies are critically important if you can qualify for them. So let's talk about how do you qualify for it? So there's three main requirements. There's an access test, access to employer-sponsored coverage. There's an income test, and there's a Medicaid or CHIP test. There's a few other requirements, but I'm not going to talk about those because they won't be of concern uh, to most RVers. So this first one is the access test, and this one was a little tricky. The test says you must have access to, inf or you must not have access to quote affordable employer-sponsored coverage. And we think, great, none of the coverage my employers are offering is affordable, uh, therefore I'm entitled to subsidies. Eh, not so fast, because our definition, the common sense definition of what's affordable is not the federal government's definition of what's affordable. So first of all, the access part, you have access if it's available, whether or not you accept it. Remember that if you decline employer coverage, you are not eligible for ACA coverage. The affordability coverage work, uh, part works like this. The plan that your employer pr provides has to provide what's called minimum value, which means it has to cover 60% of average costs, most plans do. It has to cover at least inpatient and physician services. It does not have to cover all 10 essential health uh, benefits. So most plans meet that. And then here's the sticker. The employee only premium for the lowest cost plan offered by that employer must not exceed 9.83% of your household's income. And that figure changes slightly each year. Now, notice that we're comparing the employee only premium to the income of the household, which means that if you have a spouse and they work, their income gets counted. However, the cost of their coverage does not have to be affordable. And this is called the family glitch. It was a compromise in Congress to get the ACA through back when it was originally passed. And what happens in the family glitch, this does not affect you if you are a solo. If you're a single person, you have no dependents, you don't have to worry about the family glitch. But if you have dependents that you want to cover on your plan, okay, and you're employed, the affordability of that plan is based on the employee only cost, not the family cost, but you still have to pay the family cost because your employer is not going to pay it. And, but you get to count your spouse's income. And so what happens is in this glitch, the entire family ends up being ineligible for subsidies if the employer offers at least one plan that is, um, uh, that is had, you have access to, and that is quote affordable. Employers get penalized if they don't offer affordable plans. And so what they started doing is they've offered, most employers will now offer a bare bones, minimal plan that just barely meets the ACA requirements, but really has very, very limited benefits. And they'll offer that at a rock bottom price that is almost guaranteed never to exceed that 9.83% of anybody, anybody's income. And by doing that, they take advantage of this and they don't have to, um, uh, they, they don't end up getting penalized, but it means that you may be eligible for employer coverage. You can't decline it and be eligible for ACA subsidies and you can't take it and cover your dependents because it's too, uh, too expensive. So that is a real problem that hopefully Congress will fix at some point. The other two tests are a little more straightforward. The income test is, your income has to be between 100% or 138%, depending on which state you're in, up to 400% of the federal poverty level for the size of your family. And when we're talking about income, there's a term, ACA modified adjusted gross income, which is basically your 1040 adjusted gross income 
plus a few other things that probably won't apply to most RVers, but you do need to be aware of those. Now, I mentioned that 100% versus 138%, which threshold is used as the bottom level uh, for income depends on whether or not the state where you're getting the insurance has expanded Medicaid. 36 states and the District of Columbia have expanded access to Medicaid, so they've, they now allow uh, low-income people to participate in Medicaid up to 138% of the federal poverty level. The idea being that if you're eligible for, not, for Medicaid, you're not eligible for subsidies. Um, and then there's a few more states that are expected to join them in 2021. So you need to know which state you're in to know what the bottom threshold is. The uh, income levels for subsidies are on this slide. And these are 20, uh, uh, let's see, I left off one other thing. Let's see, which is, there's a third test where I think the slide is missing, which is you can't be eligible for Medicaid or CHIP, the children's insurance program, uh, which again are for low income people. Okay, so these are the income levels for ACA subsidies. Um, you, oh, I see, I skipped a page. Um, these are the 2020 federal poverty level guidelines that are used for determining 2021 subsidies. So they always look back to the previous year. Basically, the way you use this chart is you find the number of people that you plan to cover on the left side. You look at one of the first two columns to determine the minimum amount of income you have to make, depending on whether your state has expanded Medicaid. And you look at the last column, to, which is the one people most really are be concerned about, to determine the upper income limit for your family size. And as long as you fall in between that, uh, those two, um, you are eligible for a subsidy under the ACA. All right, I talked about the Medicaid CHIP test, test which is the, um, uh, the third eligibility qualification. Now, I alluded to the a, uh, ACA subsidy cliff or the Obamacare cliff um, that you, you really need to be aware of. And I have personal experience with this, unfortunately. Um, I mentioned that as your income goes up to 400% of the federal poverty level, uh, you don't lose all the subsidy. You lose only about a third of it. So you can see that inflection point pointed to by the red arrow. That's the Obamacare cliff. And when you go $1 in income over that, you lose 100% of the subsidy. What that means is if you've been taking the advanced premium tax credit, when you file your tax return, you get to pay back over $10,000 usually in tax credits. And that happened to me last year got a small bonus from a company that I used to work for that wasn't expected on December 26th, and it pushed us over the ACA subsidy cliff, and I got to write a really big check to the IRS. Not the happiest day. So just make sure that you manage your income so you don't go over that. All right, so if your mind hasn't already exploded, let's think a little bit about how to choose from among these different options. And look, this is my own opinion that I tried to put down in this decision tree uh, as a lay person for how to at least start going about this. Uh, it is by no means dogma. Um, you, you should look at all the possible options, but here's how I would approach it. Uh, first of all, are you employed or not? If yes, keep your group plan. That's almost always gonna be the best option. If no, then run the uh, through the three ACA subsidy tests and look at your income and determine if you're eligible for a subsidy, potentially assuming you can find a satisfactory plan. If you are, then I would seriously look at changing domicile to Florida or to some other state that has an RV friendly plan that is uh, ACA um, compliant and eligible for subsidies. Florida is the most popular one for RVers. Uh, if you're in Florida, uh, use the Florida Blue PPO. It's really some of the best insurance we've ever had, honestly. Um, I can't believe I'm saying that, but it's true. If you can't domicile in Florida, then look at your state's marketplace. Pick a plan from there uh, that can be subsidized. If you really need to, maybe look at adding an indemnity plan to uh, fill in any, any gaps. Um, we are in the Florida uh, Affordable Care Act plan. Uh, we have been since the beginning of 2018, and we're subsidized, uh, except for the one year that we ran over the cliff. Um, and so it's worked out really very well for us. All right, if you're not eligible for a subsidy, 
uh, then I think the next question you want to ask yourself is, do you have a serious or chronic pre-existing condition that's going to make you ineligible for a lot of other kinds of products? And if you do, uh, I would look at COBRA if you've recently terminated employment or figure out some way to get into a marketplace plan, Florida or otherwise. This is a situation where you may just have to bite the bullet. I'm having trouble hearing you. <laughs> Great. You may just have to bite the bullet and... Um, and pay an unsubsidized premium if um, if you have to. Uh, but uh, so there's a lot of different combinations of products you could use. If you don't have a serious or chronic pre-existing condition, you have other major health issues. Uh, again, Cobra if you can. Otherwise, here you know if it's not a pre-existing condition or a chronic condition, you but you think you're at risk of something, you might look at a health uh, cost-sharing ministry or look at short-term medical, but with guaranteed issues, something that you can't be declined for. Only if you don't have any other major health issues, this is the young and healthy RVer, look at you know off exchange, individual major medical that you'll be able to qualify for through the underwriting process, or a fixed benefit plan or a cost sharing ministry. Uh, as you can probably tell, I'm, I'm much more, uh, I look much more favorably on true insurance products than I do on some of these alternative project products that aren't really insurance, if you possibly can afford it. How do you go about shopping? I would start your journey at healthcare.gov or at your state's marketplace. If there is one, you can still go to healthcare.gov and it will direct you to your state's marketplace, particularly if you think you'll qualify for subsidies. Uh, there's a calculator in there that where you don't have to do an insurance application and you can see if you'll qualify for subsidies or not. There are online portals like ehealthinsurance.com if you really know what you're doing. But if you're really not sure, I would seek out a licensed insurance broker in the state uh, where you're domiciled and uh, ask them to compare options from several different companies. You don't want to go to a, a broker or an agent who can only write insurance for one company. Uh, you want somebody who has products from several different companies and, um, and and can offer you different things. And different brokers work with different companies, so you may need to shop around for the best deal. And like you would with any other high dollar purchase, check the broker's consumer ratings. You should be able to find them on various sites and see if other people have had good experiences with that broker. If you ask around the RV community, there are a few brokers who do specialize in insurance for RVers, and you can get recommendations uh, uh, on them. And then, as I mentioned in the in the PDF, there are links to uh, some general resources, some things that I've, I've talked about here, and then a number of resources about subsidies under the Affordable Care Act um, that I encourage you uh, to take a look at. And with that, if anybody's brain isn't full at this point, uh, boy, I don't know how to fill it. Um, but I, uh, that's the end of the presentation and let's address some of these questions that have come up. Yes, definitely. Um, first, thank you so much, David. I, I, I know I've heard you give this presentation before and I've updated it since I last heard it, but there's always tons of really great, useful information and thank you so much. I'm very grateful that I have coverage through my employer, but I know there are plenty of people who are not in that position. And so yeah. thank you so much for this. Um, all right, so to go back to some of our earlier questions. So actually, first of all, let me let me do a little bit of housekeeping again. I've seen the numbers of viewers fluctuate quite a bit. And so if you're joining us later on um, after we started tonight's presentation, don't worry. The recording will be up on Facebook pretty quickly after we finish the live broadcast. You can go back and watch what you missed. Also, um, we will upload the recording to our YouTube channel. Um, it's, it's Scapey's RV Club has a YouTube channel. We'll have it on there later this week. Um, potentially early next week, and also it'll be added to the webinar archive on our website. And so if you missed part of it, don't stress, you can definitely get that information still. And David has also made the slides available. Um, Jeannie's been posting them in the comments here, but in case you uh, you want to build a reference them later, because you didn't snag the, the link just yet, those will also be included. That link will be included whenever we have the uploads later. So we got you covered, don't stress. But now to answer the questions. Um, you do if you have six days left in open enrollment, so. Okay, yes, all right, good yeah. point. So we will make this, we'll upload them. Yes. Maybe if you have done something for next year. Then sometime soon, um, okay. And so just a, a comment that Caroline made earlier on when you were talking about people considering their risk. 
Um, don't forget things like accidents, injury, trauma, that sort of thing. It's not always just ongoing health concerns. Exactly. And those are, you know, accidents by definition, you can't plan for. They're accidental. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay. And so uh, Susie has a question going back to when you were talking about the reasons people, like the causes people can pick up insurance. Um, is a life-changing event, does that include if someone decides to stop working versus yes. being terminated? Yes, that is, that is a qualifying uh, life event that, and it's life-changing in many ways, uh, not just with insurance, uh, but that does entitle you to a special enrollment period, any voluntary uh, termination of employment, uh, unless and until you become um, uh, 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 eligible for employment or for insurance through another employer is what I'm trying to say. But if you're just going to stop working, which is what I did, uh, yep, that's a, uh, a qualifying event and qualifies you for a special enrollment period. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, so thinking about indemnity plans, uh, Elfie has a question. Can you carry a fixed indemnity plan as a supplemental plan to a major medical plan? Yes, absolutely. And that is actually one of AFLAC's um, main selling points. So a lot of times what people end up with, because this is you know what they can afford or it's all that's offered, is a plan that has a very high deductible or very high co-pays. And a fixed indemnity plan can actually fill that gap. You know, you, you might be responsible for a $13,000 deductible or you know, some huge co-pays. If you've got a, a, a limited uh, fixed benefit plan, um, that could be a good strategy to um, reduce your exposure to risk in case you do have something you know catastrophic happen that would have you meet your deductible. Uh, fixed benefit plans can be good supplements to a lot of different things. And because you can kind of pick your level of benefit based on how much you want to pay, Mm -hmm. um, they give you a lot of flexibility. They do have a place, just not necessarily as your primary coverage. Yeah. And thinking about in, um, fixed indemnity plans, Richard has a question. If you are covered for a certain dollar amount, but the charge is actually lower, do you still get the difference paid out to you? Usually, yes. Um, and again, that's that's one of the, the selling points you hear the Aflac Duck talk about. Uh, generally, they don't require you to turn in receipts. Well, they, I mean, you have to have some proof that the event actually happened. But if you had a doctor's visit and the doctor charges you 80 and your benefits 100, you're going to get $100. Now, don't get too excited about that because most times the provider's going to end up charging you more than what your benefit is. But if there's an excess, yeah, usually you get to keep it. I know from personal experience, this could have been a complete fluke, but it didn't sound like it was when I talked to different insurance companies involved. Um, I, I personally had to have an MRI several years ago and was required by the facility to pay up front. And then they would get reimbursed by the insurance company and issue me a refund. Well, in the process, or whatever, whatever I was due back. Well, in the process, I went ahead and also filed with my indemnity that I had in addition to my major coverage. And both, I got both the full refund from the MRI clinic as well as the full payout from the indemnity. And both were like, it's totally fine. You, that's not fraud. That's your plans were going to the store. You're good. So I actually got extra money in the end. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. And the, the industry term for that is coordination of benefits. Uh, if you have two group health insurance plans for some reason, or, or you have some tr real insurance, not an indemnity plan, but true insurance, more than one plan that would cover the same event, most like you have uh, some uh, policy through your employer and then an individual plan or something like that, most plans state which insurance has to pay first and which insurance will pick up the excess. Um, you don't have that with fixed benefit. Uh, fixed benefit pays regardless of what other co other coverage you have. So there's no um, coordination of benefits with fixed benefit plans and traditional insurance. Makes sense. And so thinking again, um, going with all the different things available, we, we have a question. What is the large deductible you can get on an ACA or non-compliant traditional insurance, um, they, they follow to say that we've been considering catastrophic type coverage paired with the telemedicine program. Okay, that's a great question. So um, I, to, to answer the question, then I'll explain a little bit what I think she's asking. I, I, I believe there is a maximum under the ACA on a non-compliant plan, it's whatever the insurer decides to offer. 
but I think the maximum under the ACA is pretty high and the number of 13,000 something sticks in my mind. It's, it's pretty stiff. Now, I wanna talk about this term catastrophic that Kelly's using, because it's really important. The strategy that she's describing is actually a really good one if you feel like you, know, you can pay whatever deductible you sign up for. There are a lot of high deductible plans that basically say, you pay the first X dollars and the plan pays 100% of the rest. Those are usually HSA qualified plans, health savings account plans. They're called high deductible health plans. Um, people who get those are basically saying, I'm willing to take that first X thousands of dollars of risk. I just don't want the unlimited risk above it. And in exchange, you're getting a lower premium because you're taking on more risk than you would with many other kinds of insurance. So what you're insuring against is the catastrophic loss, the million, two million, five million dollar bill that if something really bad happens to you and you're saying in order to keep my premiums down and because I live a healthy lifestyle, I'm a pretty healthy person, uh, I'm willing to take that risk and it won't, it won't kill me. I might have to borrow the money. I might have to pay it out over time. But, you know, I can manage that 10 or $13,000. So it's not a bad strategy um, if, if that's what you need to do. Uh, all right, so we have a couple of questions that are kind of specific to Florida. I know that that's what you're most familiar with personally because of um, what the coverage you guys have. So Carol just wanted to confirm, I'm pretty sure you did say this, but you were on the Florida ACA, correct? Yep, okay. and specifically around the Blue Select Gold 1835 plan, which after looking for all the different plans, you know, that one had the best balance of benefits and, and premium cost for us. Okay, and so she follows that with, um, she recently heard that there's no longer a nationwide Florida PPO plan. Do you have any insight on that? So I had heard a rumor to that effect. Um, and there was actually a thread, I think, on the Skips group in Facebook today or yesterday, maybe it was on Escapers, where somebody was asking this question. I have actually sat down and looked at Florida Blue's contract, because it's a contractual relationship between you and the insurer, for my plan for 2021 and compared it to 2020. And while there were some minor differences, there's nothing in there that says that um, benefits are no longer provided nationwide. Now there is a little bit of a catch here and it's not anything new this year. My plan and I think a lot of Florida Blues plans in Florida, well, uh, in Florida uh, are combined PPO and EPO plans. PPO means you've got to use a provider in their network to get benefits. EPO means you have to use, it's an exclusive provider organization, you have to use the provider that they designate, and that's going to be in the state of Florida. There are only a few things on the Florida Blue plans that are subject to the EPO provision. One of them is durable medical equipment. My wife and I both use BiPAP machines, and so we have to buy supplies for those every quarter. We have to get those through Florida Blue's contracted provider, a company called Apria Healthcare in Florida not a big deal. They will send them out to us. They ship them. They even cover the shipping. But we, we can't just go down to the local supply store and buy them and get reimbursement. We must use their Florida provider. There's a few, so that's the category is durable medical equipment. There's a few other things like prosthetics. I think home health care is an EPO provision in Florida. But, you know, for things like that, you would go to Florida if you're going to need long-term home health care. Uh, but generally, most of the benefits that we think about insurance providing for us are going to be, as far as I can tell, uh, available uh, still nationwide through their nationwide provider network. They haven't said anything to change that. There were several people on that thread who also said they had called Florida Blue and had gotten confirmation of that. It's good to know. Um, so thinking about Florida still, but looking more to the general domicile kind of thing. Um, I don't want to get too far into the weeds specific to domicile, but I know that's, of course, tied very closely to, to health care. So, um, Lori Lynn has asked, if they are working part time in Ohio, can they still domicile in Florida? Maybe. Uh, I would even say probably, but domicile is a really complicated subject that there are so many factors you have to consider. I mean, I'm domiciled in Florida, but I work for Escapees, which is a Texas company. So yes, possibly, but there's also a lot of other things that go into establishing my Florida domicile. So the answer is it depends. Um, I'd encourage you to look at the Escapees uh, 
resource page on the website for domicile. Uh, maybe Jeannie will post that. I think it's escapees.com slash domicile, which would be clever. Um, and there's a lot of resources there about this question. You can also get a free consultation with consultation with an attorney um, who specializes in domicile issues, and they can answer a lot of the basic questions and figure out if you need to go into something more deep in order to be able to change your domicile under your specific circumstances. Definitely. And um, again, domicile becomes a tricky thing, especially if for in your example, Lori, if you're talking about working on site part time in Ohio, that could get tricky when it comes to things like taxes. It can get very messy. So definitely when you are looking at something like that, um, like Dave recommended, I would definitely seek uh, legal advice on it just so that you can be as protected as possible because you don't want to be caught in a situation where the state comes after you later because they don't believe that you were domiciled the way you say you are. And, and there are all kinds, of, all kinds yes. of to that. Especially important if you are changing your domicile from a, a state with income taxes to a state without income taxes because your home state would really like to continue collecting money from you. So uh, you really have to be very careful. Uh, Susie Adams, who is the attorney I was mentioning, uh, is in Livingston. She deals with RVers all the time. She writes articles for the magazine. I don't think there's a domicile question she can't answer. Uh, so I'd really encourage you uh, as a member to, to take advantage of that resource if you have questions. Definitely, definitely. Um, another domicile related topic, Mark um, has asked if they domicile in one state, can use a family member's address in a different state for insurance? I know the answer, but I'll let you ask. <laughs> yeah, good question. So as your mailing address, yes. But as your address for determining your um, your rates and your coverage available? No, you have to use the zip code in which you're domiciled uh, for purposes of picking a plan and um, uh, the insurer determining the rate. Now, um, Florida Blue, for if you're talking about a mailing address, uh, Florida Blue, for example, if you ask, they won't volunteer this, but they have a separate field in the profile for mailing address. And so all of my Florida Blue mail actually comes to Livingston directly yeah, to the mail service without stopping first at Sumter Oaks. Uh, but but I, I, being domiciled in Florida, I could not use the Livingston address to get Texas insurance. I would actually have to change my domicile to Texas in order to do that. Okay, so changing gears back to um, looking for insurance and considering the ACA subsidies and that sort of thing, Lori has a question about what's considered income. Are retirement plans or annuities factored into your income? Um, yes, usually. So basically, anything that you would report on your income tax return as income that would go into your adjusted gross income line is income. So that's going to it usually, in, I, I don't have an annuity, so I don't know this for sure, but I, if you pay income tax on your um, annuity payments that you receive, um, then that's going to be included in income. If, you, if it's not taxable, then it may not be. Uh, contributions to retirement plans are not um, money you take out of your IRA uh, is, if it will, if it's a traditional IRA. Because um, you pay tax on a traditional IRA, you don't pay tax on withdrawals from a Roth. So it depends on the, the particular vehicle. Basically, if you're going to report it as income on your tax return, it's going to be considered income for subsidy purposes. Plus, you will also have to include some things that you wouldn't pay tax on normally. Um, tax exempt uh, income like bonds, municipal bonds, uh, foreign income. If you have uh, investments or bank accounts in other countries, and there's one other uh, category that gets added back to this AC a modified adjusted gross income. Um, uh, yeah, I was, I, I do have some municipal bonds and I was a little surprised the first year I filed my tax returns. I didn't realize those got uh, counted and I had to write a check that year too, just not as big. Oh, okay. Well, while we're, while we're talking about um, how income affects ACA, this is kind of long, so it's, it's going to get cut off, I think, on the screen. Um, so Scott says he's going to take a he's going to take 2021 to travel the U.S. So his income will very likely be less than the required ACA minimum. Can you explain why there is a minimum and if there is any way around this to qualify, or am I stuck with getting one of the other options that you mentioned? 
So if your income is less than the ACA minimum, then you would qualify for Medicaid. The, the, the cutoff for med Medicaid, the upper income limit for Medicaid is the lower income limit for, um, uh, uh, for ACA subsidies. So you'll qualify for one or the other. The reason it's that way, and, and that sort of answers the question about why, um, you know, the, the federal government already had a plan in place for people who make 100 or 138 percent or less of the federal poverty uh, line figure. That's Medicaid. Uh, and so they basically said, look, we're not going to allow you to double dip. You can get Medicaid or you can get subsidies, but you can't get both. Uh, as long as you're staying in the U.S., I'm not very familiar with the Medicaid system, but you should be able to get um, most providers who take, not all providers take Medicaid, but those who do, you should be able to use outside of your home state because it's a federal program. I can't swear to that though, because I'm not super familiar with it. Um, all right, so thinking about Medicare, um, Ken has asked, he's on, he's on Medicare, his spouse is 62. Will there be any change in researching for the spouse's insurance? Uh, no. So um, a lot of spouses face this where one's older than the other. We'll, we'll actually have this in, in six years. Um, uh, we're, I'm older than my wife. I'll be on Medicare for a year while she's still on an ACA plan. So the only change is obviously you're only looking for individual coverage instead of uh, individual plus dependent. All right. Um, thinking about HMO potentially, thoughts on supplementing your insurance with a travel assistance program, particularly if you have an HMO? Ooh, that is a good question, Debbie. Um, it's a tricky one. I know I've had an, I've had an HMO before too, and it's they're they can be really complicated. Yeah, <laughs> well, I mean, you can much, you can pretty much say that if you have an HMO, you're out of luck outside your domicile state for anything except a true emergency. So let me kind of think this through. Uh, an HMO is going to cover you while you're traveling um, if it's a true emergency. So you're in a car wreck. Uh, you you uh, come down with you know serious case of COVID nineteen something like that where it's not feasible for you to travel back to your home state you're still going to have coverage. Those are probably the situations where a travel assistance program would be triggered um, because th that's when you would get repatriated to your home state. So I I I, I guess the answer is I don't know. It would depend. Uh, we don't carry a travel assistance program, but that's just us. I feel like if we needed to have emergency evacuation uh, someplace, partly because we're on a nationwide plan, so we can get treatment anywhere. Uh, but if we needed to be evacuated for some reason, it, the, the likelihood is so low that, you know, I'm willing to take that risk, even though it could be very expensive. I guess it would depend on um, what situations would entitle you to emergency evacuation with the travel assistance program versus what situations your HMO would not consider an emergency allowing you to get treatment outside the state. And that's just going to depend on the two plants. It's an interesting question. I had not, not thought about that. There may be something there. Um, another question about ACA eligibility. Eligibility. There you go. I can speak. <laughs> um, if I'm on a soon-to-be ex-employer's insurance program, am I eligible for ACA before the, everything is finalized? Um, or would I be ineligible because the employer plan is only available to me until things are finalized? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I'm going to guess, though, that if you're eligible for coverage, which you would be until the divorce is finalized, unless, I guess, the judge orders otherwise, uh, that probably makes you ineligible for subsidies. Uh, can't guarantee that, but that would be my guess, is that it's it's a pretty bright line test. If you're eligible for employer coverage, you're not eligible for such All right. Here's hopefully a, an easier question. Can I pay for insurance premiums with money left in my HSA account? As uh, far as I know, yes. Uh, if you've got an HSA account from a previous job or something like that, um, you should be able to pay for your HSA is not limited just to expenses incurred on the associate or while you're enrolled in the associated high deductible health plan that you had the HSA for. You get to keep that money and use it for health care anytime, anywhere. And that includes paying insurance premiums. So as far as I know, the answer is yes. 
All right. Um, we've got a question from Jeff. Is income gross or post standard deduction? Uh, it is gross okay. before deductions, unfortunately. All right. Um, and Caroline. Whether you take standard deduction or you're itemized, it doesn't matter. It's, it's what they would call above the line income. Okay. Um, Caroline shared some helpful tips throughout the chat here. One of them is um, in 2021, the max out of pocket for ACA is uh, 85.50 for an individual or 17,100 for a family. Okay, there you go. Uh, and she also she also shared. I'll read this off. It's going to get cut off on the screen. I think um, it's my understanding that if you inadvertently overestimate your income, they do not require you to refund the subsidy. Um, there's a fair amount. She says there's a fair amount about this on the internet. If you take the time to search, obviously, but of course, be make sure you're looking at reputable resources uh, for your information. Yeah. Resources. Let me let me clarify that. Wait, see. If you overestimate your income, meaning you actually made less than you expected, you not only do you not have to refund the subsidy, you're going to get an additional credit on your tax return. I think maybe what she meant to say was if you inadvertently underestimate your income, you are required to refund the subsidy, but there's a cap. And so remember how the, um, uh, and I don't remember what the amount is exactly, but basically it's there to prevent, especially for people whose income varies greatly from year to year, as long as you stay under the 400% threshold, there is a limit. I think it's $600 per person or something like that, but there is some limit to how much you can have to repay because they don't want to stick you with the whole bill. Now you go over 400%, they are happy to stick you with the whole bill. All right, makes sense. And she also shared um, in a separate comment that Medicaid is pretty much in-state only, so be careful about seeking care outside of the issuing state. Okay, good to know. Thank uh, you for that. And so with that, Scott um, followed up to your answer that, yeah, it's in his understanding or desires and he doesn't want Medicaid as the coverage. Um, he'll look into estimated income to see what you can do to qualify for ACA. Yeah, and, and you know, Scott, if you're, if you're close to the cutoff, there are sometimes some other things you can do. I mean, obviously, you know, earn a little bit more money. If you are, if you have a traditional IRA, this is one strategy I've had people use, or I've heard of people using. Um, when you convert money from a traditional IRA to a Roth IRA, that the amount that you convert is recognized as income in the year that you do it. So you're just moving it between IRAs. You're actually moving it to a better form of IRA, but it will show up as income on your tax return that year um, and that may be enough to boost you over the threshold. That's that's one way to do it. Okay. Um, we have a couple more comments that we did just to uh, insert again. If you guys have any questions, we've got a little bit more time still, so feel free if you have more questions, go ahead and add them to the comments and we'll get to them. Um, David offered earlier before we started, he figured it would be a hefty topic, so he agreed to go a little bit longer than our normal hour to make sure we could get to everybody. Um, all right, so we have a, uh, a question from Carol Taylor. We it says, we are both full-time in the RV and we're both 55. We went with MediShare and it's been great so far covering several things that she lists off. Um, she says, it sounds like an indemnity, indemnity coverage through AFLAC would be a good addition to their program. Do you agree? I, hard to say without knowing more details on, on the coverage. Uh, you know, if you've had a good experience with it and you've, you know, you can research the company, you can find out whether they um, really, uh, you know, maintain sufficient reserves, what their claims payment history has been. If you're comfortable with that, I don't know that I would spend the extra money to, you know, on premiums for an indemnity plan. It just really depends on, on where your comfort level is. You've got some experience with that plan. If you're comfortable with it, you know, I, I, would, I would say maybe just, you know, roll with that. If you, but if you start hearing about people's claims not getting paid in full or the company, you know, not being or delaying payments of claims, which I, I've heard with some of these share plans, uh, you know, then I would look at some other options. All right. Um, and also Caroline chimed back in that she, um, she actually did mean overestimate because at the time that she posted it, the discussion was about the minimum you have to make to be eligible for an ACA subsidy. So that's what she meant. If you overestimate your income okay. that are over that minimum threshold. So I, got, I got you. So what? What? So just to clarify, what she's saying is, if you you thought you you did not qualify for Medicaid, so you're over the hundred or three hundred percent or one hundred thirty eight percent threshold. Okay, 
and it turns out that your income comes in under that threshold, meaning that if you had done it right, you would have been on Medicaid rather than on an ACA subsidy. Yes, in that case, they do not require you to pay back the subsidy. I think the government figures they would have subsidized you one way or the other anyway, uh, but they're not going to penalize you if your income falls below the 100 or 138 percent of the FPL. All right. Um, we have another question from Elfie. Do you know of any plans that would help safeguard against balance billing if they don't have access to a nationwide plan? Um, another person, I maybe it may have been Elfie earlier, commented to be aware of balance billing. Yeah, so let's explain balance billing. Uh, balance billing is when the provider does not have a contract. They're not on network with your insurance company, if you have insurance. And under the contract, let me back up. Under a provider contract, the providers agree to only bill the contracted rate, even if they would normally charge more, and to not bill the balance to the patient. If you're using a provider that's not under a uh, network contract like that, they have the right to say, all right, your insurance paid X, we're going to hold you liable for the balance. Okay, and that's balance billing. Um, and the, the answer to the question is, I, I really don't. I mean, if it's, if it's true insurance, okay, if it's an ACA compliant plan, and you use a network provider, you should never have to worry about balance billing. Those are two big ifs. Um, if, now, I think what, what Elfie's getting at here is if you, know, you don't have a nationwide provider network and you have to use a provider outside the network, is there a plan that would help you know, avoid balance building and I, billing? And I think the answer is no. I think anytime you go out of your insurance company's network, you are potentially exposed to balance billing. Uh, so it's something I would talk about with your provider ahead of time if you're forced into that position. Okay. Um, and Jason offered some input regarding the, when you earlier answered the question about if HSA could be used to pay premiums. Okay. Um, Jason offered that he believes the only, it's only true that they can be used to pay premiums when it's for a COBRA premium or under certain specific scenarios, but it probably doesn't apply to most plan premiums. Okay. Well, Jason's a pretty smart guy, so I have not looked into it in detail, but uh, you know, I would say if you're thinking about paying your premiums out of an HSA, you know, definitely look into uh, the plan that you're planning to pay for mm -hmm. and see if the terms of your HSA allow you to do that. Definitely. Um, all right, so I think this is our last question, and it's a bit of a tough one. I, to be honest, I did see this come through earlier, but it's one of those I knew would be a little bit more complicated. I didn't want it to take up everyone else's question time. Um, so Debbie has asked, and another person did ask also, if uh, we've heard anything lately about the potential for associations to be able to provide group coverage, and she used escapees as an example. I know I've talked with um, an insurance uh, a contact we had through for insurance in the last couple of years about the same thing, but I'm wondering if you had any more, any more current information on it. Yeah, it, 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 it's funny that she should ask because in the first time I did this presentation at Escapade in 2019, I actually had a slide in there about association health plans. There was some recent legislation at that point that looked like it was going to allow uh, associations, you know, uh, clubs like escapees to offer insurance products to their members without them having to be employees. Um, I talked to an agent because I, I, I looked after that. I wasn't able to find a single association plan that was, was truly group insurance. There are associations that will offer individual insurance plans, but they have to be underwritten and, and you know all the other things that we talked about. What we're really talking about here with an association plan is to have group coverage, group type coverage that you can't be declined for and that you get the benefit of group rates, but um, just by virtue of being a member of a professional association or club or something like that. What this guy told me, um, it was actually, um, Georgiana, it was somebody we were talking at, in that same conversation when we were talking about escapees getting insurance, is that for whatever reason, I don't fully understand it, the legislation did not do what it was supposed to do and it did not actually, uh, when, when associations went to look to see if they could take advantage of this, 
they found out that they couldn't. And I can't really provide any more detail out of the, on, uh, on that exactly why. But right now, membership uh, organizations and associations can't really offer true group coverage to uh, their members. It would be a great thing if they could. Uh, I'm sure there's lots of reasons that the insurance industry doesn't want that. Uh, or maybe they do. I don't know. I, or, you know, I'm not sure what the what the holdup is. But in any case, right now, I haven't heard anything about that changing. The information I was given, which is which is a little bit more data than what you're talking about, because whenever I had this conversation um, with the insurance representative, it was it was when the early phases of that um, proposition being discussed and put together. So it hadn't even made it to to a hearing yet. Uh, but one of one of the big uh, hangups between for organizations being able to do that is, I believe, with insurance companies, it's a huge liability on their part to offer group coverage to opt-in organizations where you can choose to join this organization solely to get the insurance coverage that they offer. Whereas when you do it through an employer, your primary purpose is actually the job, the employment, the paycheck that you're getting, the work that you're doing. The insurance is a benefit of that, but when they offer it to voluntary um, organizations where you can choose to become a part of an organization, Right. Their liability is much higher because you can opt into the organization, get that insurance started, and as soon as you're done with whatever you need the insurance company to pay out, you can bail and they're stuck with your bill, but no more premiums from you to help offset that bill. Yeah, no, um, that makes sense. It's 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 it, it feels a little shady in some ways, but also makes some business sense in others. And so I am yeah. not an insurance expert by any means. You know way more about this than I do, but that's the little bit that I do know <laughs> about that particular yeah. question. I can that, say that, that um, we have looked into it several times, and that's actually part of the conversation where I learned that originally was talking about some options and talking through some things. Um, but it becomes it just it's it's just it's a weird gray area that uh, it's insurance companies don't have a lot of incentive to offer group coverage to opt to voluntary opt in kind of things like that. Um, and I see this question here: What about when Christian organizations provide group insurance? Um, I'm not sure if you're referring to actual group coverage insurance or if you're talking about health share plans like what David was discussing earlier on. Um, but I think even in that situation, it could be, depending on how it's set up, it could be that the same ideas with an employer, that someone is part of that organization for reasons not related to the insurance and the insurance is a perk, not a purpose. Whereas other organizations, I guess it gets, I'm kind of, Talking in circles here for myself, so maybe <laughs> and I, I've never heard of that, but I, you know, I, I suppose you know exactly what you were saying is is possible. Um, but I, I, I really think you have to. It has to be an employer group in order to qualify for true group coverage. I mean, there are a lot of organizations that offer what looks like group coverage. Like I'm, I mentioned, I'm a recovering attorney, I'm still a member of the Texas Bar, and every year I get solicitations from them. Join the Texas Bar Group Insurance Plan. Well, it's not insurance. Each, in, I mean, no, I'm sorry, it is insurance. It's not group. Every person gets individually underwritten and rated. That's not group insurance. It is a benefit, supposedly lower premiums, of being a member in the organization, but it's not true group coverage. All right. Thank you for that. Thank you for the clarification. Um, that definitely uh, added what I was stumbling over. <laughs> Thank you. But you were um, on the right. That is the, que the questions that we've had so far. We've got them all covered. Um, there are a couple of offers in here for you for thanks to the information. They owe you a steak dinner. There have been lots of appreciations that people have had to drop off. So fantastic job. Also, I echo them. Thank you so much, David, for taking the time to go through this and the time to put all that information together. I know it's not an easy topic to research. So I deeply appreciate you taking that time to share it with people. Happy to do it. Hope it helps. And, uh, you know, uh, good luck out there. Remember, if you're thinking about uh, getting onto an ACA plan, open enrollment ends in six days. So uh, don't don't miss that date because you don't get another chance until next year. Yeah. And as a reminder, um, we will have the recordings of these up pretty quickly. You will be able to access this, the recording on Facebook very quickly after um, after the broadcast is done. It just takes, takes a couple minutes to load it. You'll be able to rewatch the beginning of it. Um, in the comments, you can also see David, the link to David's slides in case you can look at those. Um, for those who are on a very time crunch, that six day kind of thing, those are your immediate options to go ahead and get more information. Um, and then we'll also have recordings up on our YouTube channel and on our webinar archive on the Escapees website. Um, 
And so we'll have that for you soon. Thank you all for joining. Um, also, just a quick reminder that we have uh, virtual campfires coming up still this month. Um, next week, we are actually going to have some of our leaders on to talk about the Peterson Spirit Award. Um, some of you may not be familiar with that, but that's something, it's a program we launched, I believe it was last year, early last year, as a way to recognize members who really go over and above um, to contribute to the community. It's actually named in honor of Joe and Kay Peterson, the founders of Escapees. And so we'll be talking a little bit more about that and hopefully um, some of the recipients who have already gotten that, some of the wonderful things that they've done. Um, and also we're gonna take a break for the Christmas week, but after that we'll come back and uh, we have another virtual campfire planned to talk about gadgets for our beers because our beers love our gadgets. Um, we did a presentation on this recently with uh, the our, our beers online university relaunch and it was a really popular uh, really popular topic that people enjoyed so i'm excited to hear more from mark about the gadgets and and the things that he has found in his travels and experience um, so thank you all again for joining thank you david for your time tonight um and sure, we'll see you in, in a week bye-bye